July. Asquidently numb. Geologist Alexander A. Miranenko of the Geological Institute of RAS Russia has proposed a hypothesis which suggests that orthocones of Ordovician oceans may have been adapted to filter feed with fleshy webbing in between their tentacles. This would account for their enormous size and how common they were worldwide, since it would be unlikely for predators to have those same parameters even in an ocean environment. The predatory lifestyle attributed to orthocones was previously assumed due to the similarities between the giant shelled cephalopods to the living nautilus, which is an active predator. Ingentia prima. As much as we know about the past, everything we do know is constantly put to the test. A new basal sauropodomorph has been described from partially complete remains discovered in South Africa. Ingentia prima, as the fossils have been named, represents a reassessment of previous wisdom of the sizes sauropod dinosaurs reached at certain times. It was previously thought that sauropod dinosaurs achieved their gigantism during the Jurassic period with adaptations such as columnar limbs, wide excessively fused hips, and balancing necks and tails. But it turns out Ingentia turns the clock back on body size many more millions of years, back into the late Triassic period, and also showcases anatomy that is more common amongst the smaller, early sauropodomorphs, such as long clawed forepaws, shorter necks, and general anatomy more like the theropods that were becoming more common during the late Triassic. There is no end to broadening our understanding of the past. Zeaufus Mayanmarensis there's a reason the theme of this year's Paleo Rewind is Amber, because someone had a field day describing all the weird little monsters that got themselves trapped. On top of a frog, an ancient bird, a tick, and a beetle, we can now add a snake to the roster of frozen amber mummies. A recently hatched baby snake found itself in the wrong place at the wrong time, and now we have this beautiful specimen. Acanacephalus johnsoni. Acanacephalus is a previously unknown species of ankylosaur from what used to be the southern part of the western continent of North America during the late Cretaceous period. This ankylosaur is unique for it is more closely related to Asian ankylosaurs than the ankylosaurs that are found in more northern latitudes in North America. This means Acanacephalus shows another example of a distant geographical separation between northern and southern Laramidia. It also had rectangular scutes above its nose, which looked like a ridge for shoveling dirt. Ling Wulong Changkai A newly described species of sauropod places the evolution and spread of the diplodocoid sauropods millions of years earlier than previously thought. Diplodocoids, like the group's namesake Diplodocus, are a group of sauropods with usually long whip-like tails and suspension bridge-like necks. They were the longest long-necked dinosaurs of all time. A sect of the group, called the Dicreosaurids, started to adapt the opposite way, with shorter necks and sturdier legs and torsos. Ling Wu Long is the new dicreosaurid that breaks up previously understood models of evolution and radiation of the long-necked diplodocoids. This new short-necked sauropod comes from the early mid-Jurassic period of China which was thought to be devoid of these types of sauropods beforehand. Now it is clear that these humpbacked, stump-necked sauropods entered into East Asia earlier than previously thought, and that a lot of the more advanced families of long necks originated earlier than we would have guessed, since Ling Wu Long was a more derived animal in younger rocks. Bigfoot the Dinosaur Despite what our episode on Bigfoot would suggest, a certain Bigfoot did in fact exist after all. Paleontologist Anthony Maltese led an expedition in 1998 to the wilds of Wyoming. In the expedition, the scientists discovered a bunch of sauropod remains, but one in particular is worth mentioning above the rest. The biggest thing they found was actually only a small part of the whole animal, a foot with a meter diameter. The specimen, named Bigfoot appropriately enough, 
belonged to an animal that was likely closely related to Brachiosaurus, but was obviously even larger. And with a foot the size of a freshly birthed placental hippopotamus, you better believe it was a giant. Paula the Draco Multiendius. One thing the world is missing is a reptile manatee. Oh wait, not anymore, the Apollo de Draco. This marine reptile, described by Carlos de Miguel Chavez, Francesco Ortega, and Adon Perez Garcia, Paula the Draco represents a suite of characteristics that suggest a manatee-like lifestyle of peaceful grazing and marine foliage. The animal had a thin jaw elegantly crowded with many small hook-like teeth that would have aided the rotund beastie with scraping any manner of seagoing plants off of rocks and the seabed. Bienerosaurus perfectius When you hear the word non-crested hadrosaur, I bet you're thinking of the monosaurus, but it turns out there's a ton of other hadrosaurs without the fancy headgear we associate with them from all over the world and all throughout the Mesozoic. A new crested hadrosaur, Bienerosaurus perfectius, has been described based on a nearly complete skeleton from the late Cretaceous of China by an enormous crew of researchers with names that would make our mouths want to implode on themselves. Yeah, we're not even gonna touch that list of names. But thanks guys for doing the research for this hadrosaur though. Calentiventus hansii. The remains of an early pterosaur were carefully desculpted out of the dry, harsh stone in what is now a desert, and what has been a desert for many times before, Utah. Calentiventus, the heavenly wind, is a new example in the lineage of the flying reptiles which gives us a rarely seen glimpse into the early days of pterosaurs. With the wingspan of your average snake that is too stressed for this, the only other relative of Calentiventus is the famous Dimorphodon of England, and they share a lot of similarities such as especially misaligned teeth, large openings in the skull, and little flaps under their chins. Cryptoparacutrugus cicatophilus This time around, the bugger in question is an actual bug by the name of Cryptoparacutrugus. Uh, I'm not going to say that a third time. A member of the beetle family, the preserved remains of this needle-sized insect shows evidence in the form of pollen stuck to the body that helped it pollinate the carnivorous cycads it lived with. Eorhynchus Achilles, Sinensius. There is an insidious nature to the brain mentally bombastic complexity of life. Everything is complex, so it really blows my mind that anyone could be so complacent enough to think finding out the evolution of some ancient group is more complex than we previously thought. Of course it is. When is something regarding the biological and geological sciences simple? Turtles are a perfect example. A new stem turtle was described Eorhynchus Achilles Sinensius from the late Triassic of China. Eorhynchus Achilles had a toothless beak, like modern turtles. Unlike our adolescent martial art wielding radiation field friends, Eorhynchus Achilles has no real shell to speak of. In fact, the ribs were extremely thick and formed a ridge framework of bones that may have helped keep the insides of the animals a bit safer than its ancestors. And that's all you can really ask for. September. Kipanicus Chengi. Alvarazsaurs are some of the strangest theropods, and it is no surprise since they are silurosaurs, and a lot of the different branches of that particular clade diverged from the basic forms, adapting to new resources and environments in different ways. You got the Therizinosaurs, Ornithomimosaurs, the Dromaeosaurs, and, of course, birds. Alvarazsaurs are known for their stubby arms often ending in only one giant claw for what purpose is still unknown. A previously unknown Alvarosaur, Kipanicus chengai, was preserved with the remains of eggshells originating from oviraptorosaurs, which may point to the diet of the Alvarosaur including eggs in some aspect. Verombe Titan The largest birds to ever live could rival some of their ancient dinosaurian ancestors, and the very largest of these flightless behemoths were the elephant birds. 
As outlined in a paper by James Hansford and Samuel Turvey, lots of the research done on the fauna of prehistoric Madagascar has been focused on mammals, which resulted in a lack of understanding the diversity of form amongst the different elephant bird species that once roamed the island. The organisation of this group of birds has largely been cluttered and has remained untouched for over 50 years. The new study organises the existing collections of fossils into the already erected Molaronis and Apionis genera, and names a new species, Varombe titan, to represent the largest fossils of elephant birds, making it the largest terrestrial bird ever found. I for one welcome our new beaked overlords. Lidu Mahordi Mafube a new ancient member of the Sauropodomorpha clade has surfaced, which is just one more example in a long line of examples showing that these giant long-necked herbivores were doing things bigger and better for a very long time. Hailing from the early Jurassic of South Africa, Lidu Mahordi Mafube, as it has been named, is known from a single fragmentary specimen. It is unusual for its size, for it has been estimated to have weighed as much as 12 tons, making it the largest land animal alive at the time, and rivalling the sizes of some later titans. October Dynamoterror Dynasties New tyrannosaurs are important in getting a better image of just how complex that family tree is especially since they were some of the last dinosaurs, and appeared relatively recently in geologic time. Just such a find was made, Dynamoterror Dynasties is its name, and unfortunately, for such a cool name, the remains are some of the most fragmentary you can get. The beast has been estimated to be around 9 meters long, and roamed the earth roughly 75 million years ago. Its discovery is crucially important, as it is one of the only fossils to have been found in the Menifee Formation, which shows that there was more Tyrannosaur biodiversity than previously thought on the western side of the Western Interior Seaway. The name is a tribute to a fossil specimen which turned out to be from the infamous T-Rex, Dynamosaurus imperiosus. Baby does as a baby do. The steps between an ancient beast's birth and death are important in understanding the natural history of not just the animal in question, but also the ecosystem the animal inhabited. A series of fossils have been described of the youngest member of the Diplodocus genus, which show how these animals changed as they aged. The baby, estimated at around 6 years old, had a skull only 24 centimeters long. The skull shows the animal started out with a blunt skull with teeth only at the front, which eventually morphed into a broader snout with teeth, then went back a bit further into the mouth. Laosuchus naga Previously undescribed amphibian, Laosuchus naga was a giant predatory crocodile-like predator which patrolled the waters of early Triassic of Laos. Consisting of a nearly complete skull, Laosuchus represents the Croniosuchian order of ancient amphibians that are in no way related to modern amphibians and acted as large crocodile-like predators, some of which even had large scale-like armor on their backs. Archaeopteryx comes around again. Re-examining fossils already collected and described might seem like more trouble than it is worth, but sometimes you may find something quite extraordinary that was previously overlooked. Looking through the 11 or so specimens of Archaeopteryx has resulted in the designation of a new species, Archaeopteryx albersdorferi. The new distinction was made due to the wonders of 3D x-ray scans which have shown this specimen of Archaeopteryx to differ from the others in fusion of skull bones and pectoral bones in different configurations, and a sturdier construction of the wing bones holding together the fingers and hands together. Propiestus Archaicus Amber Mine keeps chugging with the description of another unlucky insect which found itself in tomb. Propiestus archaeuscus was a beetle as long as a 3mm bullet is wide, with a flat body and long feathery antennae. This little insect may have used the flatness of its body and the impressive feelers to sense its way around the musty dungeons of the bark of trees a hundred million years ago. Its closest living relatives today are found in South America, and this amber fossil was uncovered in Minamar, which gives clues as to the separation and movements of the continents over time. Blind and Dumb Using the brilliant technology of CT imaging scans, scientists were able to look inside the brain of apiornithids, the elephant birds. 
They found that the part of the brain which worked to process visual images was remarkably small. This means that these big bird-sized big birds were not very good at seeing you and would have used their other senses to make their way around their lush Madagascan home. This revelation suggests the birds may have been nocturnal like their closest living relative, the kiwi. This may mean the elephant birds had bristle-like filaments around their beaks and faces to sense their way around the forests, also similar to the living kiwi birds, but I guess we'll see about that if the right remains are found. November. Lavocatisaurus agrioensis. Another sauropod has been described, which also just so happens to preserve a good amount of the skull bones. Good grief. An adult and juvenile specimens were described, and they were found in rocks dating back to the early Cretaceous of Argentina. Thanks to three specimens, the whole skeleton is known for this animal. Though the decryosaurids were short-necked, small-sized sauropods, the short-necked thing was taken to the extreme in some cases of the Rabachisaurids. The Rabachisaurids had a penchant for large humps on their backs and wide Muppet-like snouts. Turns out, Lavocatisaurus belongs to the Rabachisaurids and is a member of an anatomically basal lineage of the broad-snouted snail-backed behemoths, broadening the perspective of the impressive sauropods. Crichton Dinceratops, Kurzizanoskaya. With a crazy name like Crichton Dinceratops, Kurzizanoskaya, you know this one's got to be good. Ceratopsians are pretty much everything you could want out of a dinosaur. Horns, check. Frills, check. Big hefty tank like bodies, check. Big old legs for standing and fighting, check. They were pretty cool cats. Second only to the hadrosaurs in diversity of skull shape. The Ceratopsians were a commonplace part of the Cretaceous ecosystems of the world. This new species from the late Cretaceous of Arizona is unfortunately very fragmentary, but represents another offshoot of the Nasutoceratops lineage of the Centrosaur family tree, a group of big nose, nose horned frilly beasts that made it to the very end of the age of dinosaurs. Miyaraki Itonai Birds are the modern descendants of dinosaurs and are therefore themselves members of Dinosauria. No self-respecting scientist can say otherwise. However, birds originated before the extinction of the non-bird dinosaurs and emerged from Dromaeosaur-like ancestors through tens of millions of years of evolution and were able to eke out a living in the pterosaur-crowded skies of the Mesozoic era. A new Enantiornithin bird and the late Cretaceous of Utah represents one of the largest of these ancient bird lineages, Miyake Isonai. The size of a deliciously plump raven, Mirakii was capable of more advanced flight than its relatives, evidenced by the presence of quill knobs in the forearms, which deeply anchored feathers to the arm, a V-shaped wishbone for bigger and stronger flight muscles, and the sternum is deeper to provide for the bigger muscles. Gordodon Cranerai. Polycosaurs are a group of proto mammals belonging to the Synapsa group, which we also belong to. They were very different from us in many ways, and plenty retained and convergently developed or redeveloped somewhat reptilian traits, though we split from the family tree before the origin of Reptilia proper, so whatever. A lot of these creatures sported tall spines on their backs, which formed sails with unknown purposes. A new sail-backed proto-mammal, Gordodon Craneri, shed some light on the vegetarian tendencies of the Adaphosaur lineage of proto-mammals. Gordodon had a set of large teeth at the very front of the mouth, after which was a toothless space called a diastema, which was then followed by molar-like teeth at the back of the mouth. This arrangement of teeth is the earliest example and is seen in much later animals, like deer and goats. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Breaking headlines at the end of 2018 was the outrageous description of a previously unknown baby armed theropod dinosaur with a smushed in face by the name of Thanos Simonatoi. That's right, the Mad Titan has given his Latin based name to the incredibly fragmentary remains of an abelosaur theropod. By fragmentary, we mean pretty much as fragmentary as you can possibly get a single bone. Unfortunately for the <laughs> epic <laughs> name, 
Thanos is based off a single vertebra from the part of the neck that held up the head, which probably means it will be eventually seen as too fragmentary to remain a distinct scientific designation. The paleontologist that discovered the fossil definitely should have gone for the head. Lysovitsia boani. Dysonodonts are pretty intriguing little porkers. With the body and possible habits of a hippopotamus, the stubby legs of a pig, the short stumpy tail of a bear, broad flat head of a turtle and tusks of a wild boar, the Dysonodonts were a mascot worth group of adorable pudgy proto-mammals that took over the world during the Permian period and died out at the end of the Triassic period, and a new group of the animals, Lysovitsia boani, pushes the boundaries of this group beyond what was previously thought. This elephant-sized, nine-ton tusks wonder was the largest animal alive at the time and the largest Dysonodont so far discovered. Not only is the size exemplary, but its fossils originate from rocks that date back to the late Triassic period of Poland, which means that Dysonodonts were alive and kicking even at the end of their reign. A sucker's born every minute. A new study by entomologist Dr. George Poyner, the guy we can thank for the idea to extract DNA from fossilised mosquitoes, took a look at a bunch of different ABBA preserved, blood sucking arthropods from 15 to 100 million years ago. He discovered these little annoyances were carrying various disease carrying microbes, bacteria, parasites, and hitchhikers which would have spread countless diseases among the Earth's primordial inhabitants, just as they do today. Is anyone getting itchy? Myobelina nespidae. Whale evolution is a bit of a dark mystery. When did they lose their teeth and develop baleen? The description of the 33 million year old Myobelina nespidae shows a possible key to the direction the evolution of baleen took. Maya Bolina was discovered in the 1970s and was finally cleaned and CT scanned in more recent decades. The scan showed that this whale had no teeth in its mouth whatsoever, but its upper jaw was developing in the way the upper jaws are used in modern baleen whales. The upper jaw of Maya Bolina was flat, reinforced and had a big broad roof to it, while the lower jaw was thinner but would have been connected to very powerful cheek muscles. This arrangement is similar to the modern filter-feeding marine mammals, but it was missing the filter-feeding teeth, and it has been suggested that Myobolina would have sucked in big gulps of water and sifted out the water for the smaller prey items like fish and crustaceans, which were then swallowed. December. Stop your blubbering. During the Mesozoic era, the oceans of the world never got to the frigid temperatures we see in the polar regions of present day. However, that doesn't mean that it could never get cold. The animals that thrived in these environments were reptiles, fish, and birds. There were no mammals. So it may be a shock to find out that the large-bodied marine reptiles are more like mammals than was previously thought. The larger you are, the more likely you are to produce heat from just being alive. And the larger you are, the more likely you are to keep that heat. Such is the case for the leatherback sea turtle of today. Despite being related to cold-blooded reptiles, the shelled navy blue leviathan is capable of traversing the cold depths of the Atlantic Ocean because it is so large that it is effectively warm-blooded. And it is very likely that marine reptiles of the Mesozoic were similarly kinda cold, kinda warm-blooded animals. A recently described fossil of the ichthyosaur, Stenopterygius, has preserved the impressions of soft tissue. And the particular soft tissue is a couple inch thick layer of blubber that would have encased the entirety of the fish-like reptile to keep it warm when it dived down to the extreme depths in search of a calamari dinner. Most marine reptiles also give birth to live young, so grows the mountain of evidence that these reptiles are more mammal than we give them credit for. My oh my, a Miocene. Despite the current stance of the United States Administration on climate change, it is a very real thing and will continue to be so until we collectively resolve to fix or reverse it, or we all accept its potential inevitability and reap the consequences. Recent studies done by a multinational group of climate scientists 
and have suggested that the rate at which our planet is warming is setting a course for the future of Earth that will place it at a similar climate to what it was like back in the Miocene Epoch 50 million years ago. Though the comparison and what it means for us and every living thing on the planet seems bleak, and it is, it is possible for us to reverse this, but a separate video going in-depth would be needed for an achievable schedule to be produced. Four hundred and fifty times one hundred legs. Millipedes are some of the most adorable of the creepy crawlies you can own. Generally harmless with teeny little faces, antennae that also function as mustaches, and a million little legs that tickle, lends them preference in the herpetological hobby. Turn the clock back a hundred million years and they're still around, but this time trapped in amber. 450 newly described specimens of millipedes fossilized in amber are the oldest known examples of certain groups and offshoots of the millipede family that went extinct. Nanjinganthus dendrostyla. There's always room for crushing stereotypes and turning down archetypal ideas of ways things worked in prehistoric times. This time, a previously known species of plant breaks the old moniker. The last of the dinosaurs saw the first flowers. Nanjinganthus dendrostyla is the earliest known angiosperm flower on record, dating back to 174 million years to the early Jurassic period. No longer are flowers restricted to the Cretaceous period, but may have been a component of ecosystems for a lot longer. Feathers still in style. An international team of scientists have finally solved the answer of what is actually covering the bodies of the flying reptiles. Pterosaurs are known to have been covered from head to toe in small hair-like coverings which have been called pygnofibers, because they are different yet similar to feathers and hair. After analysis of different fossil specimens with clear impressions of pygnofibers, the team found that there are four distinct types of filaments seen amongst the different types of pterosaur groups, and the filaments are actually modified feathers. Four types of feathers were distinguished. Simple filaments that look like hair, bunched filaments ending in a brush-like structure, filaments with a tuft of feathers halfway down the shaft, and a downy filament. Some of the fossils preserve melanosomes which correspond to a generally brownish gingery color from a group of sparrow-sized frog-mouthed pterosaurs called aneurygnathids. Saltriovenator zanellae. Ceratosaurs are an interesting group of early theropod dinosaurs. They do not place very well amongst the grand group of the theropods. Obviously, they are more of an early basal group, but where exactly is not an easy answer. Abelosaurs are the short-muzzled, tiny-armed descendants of the ceratosaurs, and have been aligned accordingly. And the new ceratosaur described from Italy adds another member to the early start of this family tree. The specimens of the new member of the ceratosauria clade were originally found in 1996, but was informally named Saltriosaurus. After extensive analysis and proper description, the newly renamed Saltria venator breaks the record for largest theropod from the early Jurassic period. Well, that about wraps it up for all of the discoveries and descriptions of new and exciting things in 2018. We all want to thank you for watching us and hope you continue to do so in the new year. I would personally like to thank each and every person involved in the making of this video because they're all a bunch of great people who make equally great content as part of one of the better internet communities out there. I would motion you to all go check out the content of the narrators of this video because I watch them and enjoy each and every one of their videos myself. Shout out to our coming! Aiden Cherkes brings a lot of wry humor and personal touches to his channel Kikizilla101. We've met in person and he's a cool dude with a great passion for the paleontological sciences. Y'all should go check him out. Spencer Mayhew of Cretaceous Cast is also a friend of mine in real life and is attending college in the field of geology and biology, just like me. His content is similar to my own in topic alone, for he brings a sense of happiness and love for what he does that I don't even think I have. And he's obsessed with Jurassic Park, so that's fun. David from Spinal Dude Reviews is one of the best dino toy reviewers on YouTube. He knows his paleontology and uses it to critique the little plastic monsters we keep on our shelves. 
Eric from the channel Dino Man is known for his live streams and his Dinosaur Island style videos. I think you should check him out. Christian from Prehistorica does similar videos to our own in tone, but his delivery is very interesting and he tackles some really cool topics. He is the creator of our Bone Wars miniseries. Henry the Paleo Guy, though influenced by the style of Trey the Explainer, has been able to take it to a different level unique to Henry alone. His perspective from New Zealand peppers his videos with a sense of wildlife conservation for the birds of his home. Ben and Ollie from Ben G. Thomas are fantastic creators I have worked with before. A team of a few close friends, the Ben G. Thomas channel makes lovely content, and honestly, I kind of wish I had been subscribed to them earlier. Trey the Explainer. Not much is really needed to be said of Trey, other than, you know, barn owls and basking sharks. Gibson of Bionicosaurus is probably at the top of paleontology focused reviewers. His content includes scientifically accurate dinosaur figures taken out into the wilderness with deliciously crisp camera quality, figure reviews, and much, much more. And finally, Dylan of The Paleo Archive. Though the channel has not seen new content in a hot sec, the content that is there is fantastic and a collaboration between many determined young paleontologists. Links to these channels will be in the subscription. Follow them if you find their content your cup of tea. If y'all remember, last year I made up a list of predictions of fossil discoveries for 2018. Here is that list. More feathers! Nocturnal theropods. Diggin theropod. Cambrian weirdo. Terrestrial crocodile. Omnivorous ornithischians. Now, how did it align with what was described? Feathers were definitely found, and a few even with pigments attached to them, and lots of Cambrian weirdos were announced. Unfortunately, the digging theropod remains are still unnamed and undescribed. No irrefutable nocturnal theropods were described, no terrestrial crocodiles, and no omnivorous ornithischians were described either. Two out of six, huh? Oh well, maybe next year. From now on, I'm gonna keep this list running every year. Those that get discovered will be removed from the list and new ones added for the next year. So, in the place of the last two, which did come true, I'm gonna add perfectly preserved marine reptiles. This year was a freaking treasure trove for marine reptiles. I bet next year will bring us even more marine reptile fossils. Probably so well preserved that soft tissue impressions will be found and a whole slew of new things will be learned about them. And I can't wait. A new polar tyrannosaur. I predict a new tyrannosaur will be described from what is now the icy wastes of the North Pole. Nanaxaurus shouldn't have all the limelight for tyrannosickles. So here's the new predictions list for 2019. Fingers crossed! Full steam ahead for 2019! Hope you all had a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and Happy New Year's.